Let's pray again, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Oh, we're grateful. And uh, when we don't feel like being grateful, we're asking that you'd help us with that. Um, you've given us so much. I know you'd want us to enjoy it, so help us with that in Jesus' name. Amen. How are you doing? Raise your hand if you've got something that you're thankful for. Okay, you put your hands down. Raise your hands if you always feel grateful for the things that you have to be thankful for. A couple of hands can do it. 1961, a scientist named Edward Lorenz was running a mathematical model to predict the behavior of a weather system. And he was running it a second time and rounded. When you're in elementary school, you learn to round things for various reasons. He rounded up to three decimal places instead of seven. And when the computer spit out the answer to the mathematical model there, it came out completely different. Three decimal places is, you know, seems like a pretty small measurement, right? And so Dr. Lorenz wrote about it in a scientific paper, and he quoted a weatherman that said, if Lorenz was right, one flap of a seagull's wings would change global weather patterns forever. <laughs> Ten years later, Lorenz hosted a talk that was titled, Does the Flap of a Butterfly's Wings in Brazil Cause a Tornado in Texas? And thus was named the Butterfly Effect. Ever heard of the butterfly effect? Somebody in the back said, yes, okay. You hear it in science fiction a lot, but it has uh, reaching consequences in our world, the real life as well, okay? Sometimes it's just a matter of un unforeseen consequences. Kind of a politician might enact a law that promotes campaign finance reform and then doesn't have enough money to get elected. Uh, a lone gunman shoots an archduke and you have not one but two world wars. Unforeseen consequences. Unforeseen consequences in the Bible. Uh, David sees a beautiful woman bathing on a roof, invites her to the palace, and years later four of his sons die. His son Solomon marries one pagan wife and then another, and then another, and Solomon's son has the kingdom torn away from him. Abraham is promised a child. Sarah is too old to have children, so... Abraham weds his slave girl, has a baby with her. It turns out God was planning a miracle inside Sarah. So two sons, one natural, one miraculous. And because Abraham couldn't wait for God, over 3,000 years later, the family is fighting over the estate on the Mediterranean. Unforeseen consequences, butterfly effect of negative, even sinful actions. What about good things? Unintended consequences, unforeseen consequences for good things. Can we get a butterfly effect in a positive way? Anybody here love the holiday season? Lots of enthusiasm. Maybe you're like that character in Elf. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. And some of, us, some of you are like that guy in another film. So it begins. Am I the only one? No, okay, someone was brave enough to say that. Uh, going out of town for Thanksgiving, anyone? Excited? Yeah. That is a good thing. Uh, holiday traditions, you might have one where you go around the table and give thanks. Anybody do that? One thing you're thankful for, All right? Uh, do you like being made to be thankful? Okay, now I feel less lonely. Thank you for admitting that. One tradition you get this holiday season, you get one sermon about Thanksgiving at least. Maybe you'll have another one next week too, I don't know. Um, I have a thesis that uh, gratitude or thankfulness is the one thing, the butterfly wings that can create unforeseen positive effects inside you and inside me. And sometimes we need that. I'll put my hand up for that. Okay? And the Bible is full of exhortations to thankfulness. You've heard them over and over again. We read about them in the Psalms. Maybe you've had memory verses in years past that have to do with thankfulness. Psalm 106 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and for His steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 100, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. 
Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Enter His thanks. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. His course with praise. You've heard that one before. Okay. Here's one from the New Testament. Uh, not so much a psalm, but uh, a verse of encouragement from Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Heard that one? Memory verse? Okay. If a fellow isn't thankful for what he's got, he isn't likely to be thankful for what he's going to get. Wait, that's not in the Bible, sorry. <laughs> Some guy named Frank A. Clark. But that's true, isn't it? Okay. You can go on and on with that. And sometimes you feel it. And sometimes you don't feel it. Paul frequently starts his letters with, I thank God for you. And the good things is doing, God is doing in the lives of the people that he's writing to in those letters. If you put the word thank into Bible gateway, you'll get like 130 verses in the Bible. Give or take, depending on your translation. Uh, even verses that don't seem to be initially about gratitude or thankfulness can send us there. Be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. Is that true? Yes, it is. That's Proverbs 4, verse 23. Be careful what you think, for your thoughts run your life. And some of you find it easy to be thankful, and some of you maybe not so much. And sometimes we go through seasons of life where thankfulness is easy, and sometimes not so much. It's okay if you have times where you struggle with gratitude. I read, getting ready for this sermon, that three in five people struggle with feeling truly grateful at Thanksgiving. You don't have to raise your hand. That's like around 60%. And it's not that we don't think we have things that we're blessed with, but it's just, maybe it's just being told that you have to feel thankful. And um, if you're in a time right now when you are thankful and gratitude is something that you feel, bear with us. You can still be a part of this <laughs> time this morning because you may come to a, a point in your life where it's a struggle, in which case I hope you remember what we talk about today. If you're one of the three and five this morning, this is for you. I don't like being told to feel thankful or how I, what my attitude should be. Anybody ever been told that they needed an attitude correction? Adjust your attitude, Tommy. Okay. Go around the table. Say something you're thankful for. Mm. Air. I'm grateful for this air that I'm breathing in and out. See, our brains are wired to look for what's wrong. Okay? This is why I say it's not your fault. Uh, it's an adaptation God has given us for living in a fallen world. It enables us to plan ahead, see danger. Uh, gratitude is in a natural state. If you can do it, it's because you've had practice. Instincts go the other way. Negative experiences we have that sometimes come to mind may direct our attention to things that can go wrong. And sometimes we're so wired to the negative that we see negative things that aren't really there. Worrying too, worrying too much about, for example, what people think of us, when in fact they're not thinking about us at all. They're thinking about what other people will think of them. Okay? So this sort of negativity bias is built into our brains. It's not your fault. And then we, you live in a culture where everything seems to be built around dissatisfaction. The advertising industry is opposed most of the time to one of the Ten Commandments, do not covet. That is, do not desire for yourself something that belongs to somebody else. That The commandment encompasses belongings, it enc encompasses relationships, and we're surrounded by ads that make us feel about, bad about what we have, even if what we have, in actual fact, is really good. We spend money we don't have to get things we don't need in order to impress people we don't like. That's not in the Bible either. It's been attributed to a lot of people, everyone from Dave Ramsey to Edward Norton, of all people. So, negativity bias and not being grateful, that's a natural state, okay? It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. It's not my fault, but it is my responsibility. If we have these things going on inside us, if we don't take stock and deliberately go the other direction, it will lead us away from the Lord. Being wired for ingratitude is not our fault, but it's our responsibility, and it's a big deal because, as the book of Romans says, this is humanity rebelling against God. We have to pay attention to, to negative things sometimes for safety, but our attitude 
should be one of thankfulness. Romans says this, Although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So if I remain in an unthankful state, I'm going the wrong direction. And I'm saying this to me and if, you, if, if the shoe fits, wear it. Okay? Thankfulness is a, big, is a big deal. That's why the Bible talks about it so much. And if you look at, and that's from Romans chapter 1, it's kind of a famous passage. Um, it strongly suggests that everybody, whether they've heard of the Bible or heard of Jesus or not, has enough knowledge from God in nature to at least worship and give thanks. And uh, if you're familiar with Romans, you know that Paul is, is going after everybody, all of humanity, because everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And one of the things that causes that is a lack of thankfulness. Which is bad, because sometimes I have an attitude that is not thankful. Is it possible to be grateful when we're wired against it and it's so hard? The answer is yes. Otherwise, God wouldn't have asked us to do it. It's something, something we do with His help, let's say. Acts chapter 16. This is... Uh, story that takes place in the city of Philippi, the first city in Europe to hear the story of Jesus from Paul. And in the course of the story, there's some converts. They decide to follow Jesus, and Paul and his, his entourage baptize them. And there in Philippi, a psychic slave girl begins following them around and mocking what they're saying. Now, we think of psychics in our time as being charlatans who make up stuff. They have their infomercials. And... Um, this was similar in that it was a bit of a money-making scam, but there was some supernatural dark force at work here because eventually Paul gets sick of this mockery this girl is doing, and he commands this evil spirit that happens to be inside of her out in the name of Jesus Christ to get out of her. So there was like a, a demon inside her that was giving her insights. And when Paul commanded the demon to leave, it had to go in Jesus' name. And this was a problem. It was good for the girl, because she didn't have this, this evil cloud inside of her mind anymore, but uh, she was a slave girl. There were some owners that were making a lot of money based on her abilities. And so they were quite furious at their loss of income. The owners of the slave girl beat up Paul and his companions, Paul and Silas, had them arrested, brought before a judge. There was a mob involved. The story gets picked up here in verse 22 of Acts 16. The crowd joined the attack against them. The Roman officers tore the clothes of Paul and Silas and had them beaten with rods. Ouch. Ow. And Paul and Silas were thrown into jail, and the jailer was ordered to guard them carefully. When he heard this order, he put them far inside the jail and pinned their feet down between large blocks of wood. Okay, beaten with rods by a mob, and they're trapped in these, these stocks, your Bible might say kind of hard to get comfortable after being beaten up and stuck this way, right? What do these guys have to be thankful for? They're not dead. Not dead yet. Can't even squirm around to get comfortable. A Paul wrote in one of the earliest books of the New Testament in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And now Paul has the opportunity to put his money where his mouth is. Because he has been beaten up and he is stuck in the stocks with his friend. Is this going to be a moment where he can do what he has told his followers to do? Or is it going to be, maybe like I would, guys, I'm going to have a do what I say, not what I do moment here. Give thanks in all circumstances. What are your circumstances? Sometimes you feel like whining in church. <laughs> Anybody uh, been publicly flogged this week? Raise your hand. A couple hands. That was different than Oasis. <laughs> this is more. This is a harder town than I thought. Okay. I don't want to make light of our issues. I don't like being told you must be grateful because sometimes my emotions are just not there, and an emotion is a biological fact. Okay. It's in your brain. God made your brain and made chemicals in your brain. And sometimes, just like the other parts of our body, things go a little haywire. Or maybe we have bad experiences that, prop, that prompt chemical reactions inside us. 
One of the worst things you can do is to try to bypass or suppress those feelings because you've heard it's better for you to be grateful. Now, it is better for you to be grateful, but you cannot pretend that something isn't there. Emotions are a real thing. And we have to acknowledge those, to look at them and say, yes, this is how I'm feeling. But we don't have to stay there. So many of the Psalms start in very dark places, but then they make a direction that they go. Emotions are a real thing, but we don't have to be ruled by them. Thankfulness is not primarily a feeling. I had to tell myself as I was getting ready for this this week. You can have grateful emotions, but if we were talking about something that comes naturally to people, the Bible wouldn't have to tell us so many times to be thankful. If you have bad feelings and emotions, that's okay. Don't play them down. Don't ignore them. Remember that you have company among God's people, even in the Scriptures. You may have to be present with your pain, but you don't have to stay there. Paul and Silas, here in the story in Acts 16, are covered in raw bruises, trapped with their legs between blocks of wood, can't get comfortable. And what would you do if you were Paul and Silas and you didn't know the story? I mean, you know what the right answer is if you've heard the story, but if you hadn't heard the story, what would you do? Ow. 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 <laughs> Pray, somebody said, cry. The Bible says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing songs to God as the other prisoners listened. And just looking at this, I have this suspicion that it might have taken them a little bit of time to get into that state. They didn't have electric lighting in cities, and so they were dependent on when the sun went down. And I think that they may have been in a little while before they started singing, because it says midnight. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing songs to God. Now, Paul and Silas had a choice here. and They have somehow got into a place where they are singing. The other prisoners did not have a choice. It says the other prisoners were listening to them. Yeah, they had to because they couldn't get away. Do you think it was easy for Paul and Silas to sing? Or did they have to at least put forth effort at the beginning? Well, I don't want to put too much into the text that isn't there, but I do think that we can go so far as to say that these two guys, Paul and Silas, knew that singing and giving thanks would be good for them. Um, when I play music with the kids here at worship or uh, with the band at the other church, it doesn't matter how bad I'm feeling when I start. By the time we're done, I feel better. Every time, without exception may not feel perfect, but I definitely feel better. Okay? There are such things as thankful, grateful emotions, but that's not where thankfulness starts. It can't because giving thanks isn't natural. God has to tell us over and over in His Word to be thankful. Gratitude is not an emotion or a mood. It starts with the decision, and you might not have the strength to actually do it. But you can ask for the ability to give thanks. It doesn't say that they prayed for the ability to sing in prison, but maybe they did. And by midnight they could do it. Start by asking God for the ability to be thankful. Uh, you know what forgiveness, let's make it a little bit of a spiritual analogy here. Uh, is forgiveness an emotion? Okay, raise your hand if you ever had somebody do something wrong to you that you had to forgive. Okay, I am not the only one. Thank you. Okay, some of you guys are willing to admit it. Did you feel an emotion of forgiveness? No. Okay. And so if you can't forgive, you know, God says if you don't forgive, then you can't be forgiven. And, and so we have to ask God for help with forgiveness. And I think gratitude is very much the same sort of thing where if we can't feel it, we can ask. Give thanks. God says, okay, and you can say, God, help me to give thanks. And here Paul and Silas are singing in the prison, and the other prisoners are listening to them. And the Bible says there was a strong earthquake that shook the foundation of the jail. And all the doors of the jail broke open, and all the prisoners were freed from their chains. The jailer woke up and saw the jail doors were open, and thinking that the prisoners had already escaped, he got his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted, Don't hurt yourself, we are all here. This is real life. This story happened. And yet there's maybe some symbolism here going on. The singing and the praising that they're doing at midnight breaks open their prison. And if you're trapped in a bad spot, spiritually or emotionally, 
and you ask God for the strength to praise Him or to be thankful, and He gives that to you, you might find yourself broken free. Here in the story, what's the bigger miracle? The earthquake or the fact that all the prisoners stay there? <laughs> because something changed inside them. The, the prison was no longer the biggest thing about them. Something changed. It wasn't the singing that was all that good. If you've been beaten up, I imagine that your voice probably isn't at its tip-top shape. <laughs> Dry throats. Come on, guys, that was great. Give us another song. You could be professionals. Maybe not. There was something inside Paul and Silas that gave them the ability to sing despite deep physical wounds. The jailer told somebody to bring a light, and he ran inside, shaking with fear, fell down before Paul and Silas. He brought them outside and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, maybe you learned this verse, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and all the people in your house. And it's this, this belief that opened the door for Paul and Silas to be able to sing at midnight. And we think of being in heaven someday and going to ask Bible characters, how was it that you were able to do this and that? We think of them as, as, as superheroes. Paul and Silas. Bible characters. They can do it. Hey, Paul got a vision of Jesus. He could, do, he could do miracles. There's this earthquake in the story. If I had those experiences, I could sing with my bruised legs and stocks. It would be no problem. But they're normal people. We think of them as, as, as sort of larger than life, but that's not the case. They were people like you and me, and it took them until midnight to start singing. If giving thanks takes too much energy for you, ask God for it. You know, the word gratitude and the word grace have the same root. Gra gratitude is a gift of grace. And I pray that for you. We're not talking about something easy. G.K. Chesterton, who was amazing at writing about ordinary life in a way that makes it seem magical, had several great passages about thankfulness. One of them is, Thanks are the highest form of thought, and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. He also said, Gratitude, being nearly the greatest of human duties, is also nearly the most difficult. So if we find it difficult, that's okay, it's normal. And yet the payoff inside us is huge. The butterfly wings flap, a little bit of gratitude, a little spark gets going, and, and it spreads throughout the rest of our experience. You can find cognitive science about this, deliberate practice of gratitude. I talked about it last year. Um, you know, make a list of five things you're thankful for before you go to sleep. The most recent science... Science giveth and science taketh away. But the most recent science is, don't do it every night, do it every couple of nights so that you're not forcing it. Okay? Whatever your gratitude practice is, if you need suggestions, you can Google it or DuckDuckGo or whatever your search engine is. There are ways to practice it. I'm not going to spend any more time on that. But if you want thankfulness and don't have it, start by asking God for it. And that gratitude will work its way through the rest of our experience. Science is merely catching up what God has told us in His Word. Be thankful. So you're going to go to the Thanksgiving table this week. Uh, anybody planning to stick olives on all five fingers? <laughs> okay. Anyone looking forward to the tryptophan from the turkey? Get nice and sleepy afterwards. Okay, there's a couple of hands for that. Amen. Anybody going to watch a game? Okay, yes, a couple of hands there. You know, it's, it's his, history and mythology that uh, this Thanksgiving holiday started with pilgrims. And some of us here have that as part of our family line. We wouldn't be here today if the pilgrims hadn't shown up in Plymouth. Did you know that for every hut the pilgrims built, they dug seven graves These are the people we get Thanksgiving from, the holiday. Seven graves for every hut. The Puritans there had a prayer, and this is where I'll end. They said, Father, you have given us so much, we ask for one thing more, a thankful heart.